Hello and welcome to the Fat Boss Guide to Hellya in the Trial of Valor. So you finally made it to the last boss, and you're probably thinking that it's going to be ridiculously hard. And surprisingly, it's not actually that difficult. It doesn't really have that much of a high healing requirement, and the damage requirement arguably isn't that high either. It's all about just having the damage in the right place at the right time, and dealing with all the mechanics correctly. And when it comes down to making your composition for this group, you can virtually bring anything you like. Based off most guilds findings on the PTR, melee DPS were particularly bad on this encounter because of the size of the hitboxes, but that has now been improved on live servers, and melee DPS as a result are perfectly fine. But that aside, there's a lot of things you need to know about this encounter, and let's go straight into it and let's talk about phase one first. Now in phase one, you'll be fighting Helia all by herself. You've got to make sure that a tank is always within melee range of her, otherwise you'll deal a burst of AoE damage to the raid and gain a permanent stacking damage buff that you really don't want to have to deal with. On a timer, she'll cast Bio Water Breath. This is a large conal breath directed towards the tank. This breath will do a large amount of damage to that tank and it will most likely one-shot any non-tank players. It'll also apply a debuff which reduces the tank's armor by 100% for 30 seconds and this pretty much forces you to taunt off of each other after each breath. Now on top of this, the breath also spawns several slime adds. These adds are stationary and you can't really move them around even via grips or knockbacks, and all they'll do is just sit there and cast for 20 seconds, and at the end of this cast they'll explode. Now the explosion deals damage to the entire raid and leaves a pool of goo on the ground which lasts around 45 seconds. Now both the amount of damage dealt by the explosion and the size of goo left on the ground is lowered by the amount of health the adds have when they get off the cast. So you want to do as much damage to the adds as you can to ensure that the cast that they do causes as little issues for your raid as possible. And the best way of dealing with that is just to kill off all of the adds. This causes them to do a little bit of an explosion when they die and spawn a tiny little pool, but it's like much better than letting them get their cast off. So just do your best to try and kill all of them off. Every single one of your DPS should switch onto them just to make sure they die. Now previously when we tested this boss, we did actually find that having the breath face towards one side of the room, whilst making sure none of the little ads spawned on top of either of the elevated platforms, was a super easy way of dealing with it. However, we found that with a larger raid size, having the breath go down the middle of the room was a lot better, as it allowed the raid to be split into two groups on either side of the room. This meant that the raid could be spread a lot easier for other mechanics in the fight, whilst also making sure that everyone is in close proximity to the ads when they spawned, making it so they could just die a lot quicker. Either of these positions do work, just choose one of them and stick to it. Now one of the reasons that you want to be spread is for the Orb of Corruption. Several orbs will spawn on the locations of players and they'll fixate on that player and chase them for 8 seconds while stealing pulsing AoE damage to anyone nearby. You want the players who are fixated by the orbs to kite them away from the group whilst the rest of the raid moves out of their way so they don't take any of the extra pulsing AoE damage. Now the off tank is always targeted by this ability. Make sure that you kite it away, but also that you are back at Hellia within time to taunt for the next Biowater Breath. This is always possible to do, however at certain points it's a little bit closer than you'd maybe like it to be. Just act fast, and if you have to take maybe one tick of the orb, it's not the end of the world, just make sure you're back in time to taunt the boss after the breath. Now being pre-spread also helps with the Taint of the Sea debuff. This places several dispellable debuffs to the raid. These debuffs do a high amount of ticking damage and when they are dispelled, they'll leave a green swirly circle on the ground which will explode after a short time, dealing a ton of damage to anyone nearby whilst also knocking them around. You want to dispel these debuffs as soon as you possibly can just to reduce the amount of damage that they deal, and after it is dispelled, anyone nearby of course will need to move from the explosion. Now this debuff is always placed on the tank who is tanking Hellya, and there will be points in the fight where this debuff is applied to them just before a breath goes on them. It is important that this tank is dispelled instantly whilst they stand slightly away from where they are facing the breath. As soon as it has been dispelled, they should then move out of the circle and into the correct position for the incoming breath. Now we assign certain healers to dispel certain debuff targets. We always got three Tainted the Sea debuffs, so we just assigned each healer a number. That healer, so say you are healer 1, you would dispel the first person within your raid frames. If you're number 2, you'll dispel the second person within the raid frames and number 3 would do the third one. Assuming that you haven't got some random add-on that's changing the order of people within the raid frames, this is a super simple way of making sure everyone's dispelled very, very quickly. Now throughout the phase, a tentacle will spawn in either one of two locations, either right next to Hellya or right at the back of the platform. This tentacle will then slam into the ground, dealing a large burst of damage split between everyone within its targeting area. However, if nobody is hit by it, the raid will take a huge amount of damage and you'll likely just get one shot, so you need to make sure you soak them. Now, if you have a large amount of melee DPS, they can usually soak the tentacle at the front of the room by themselves, and if anyone else is nearby, they can just jump inside to help soak it as well. 
However, the tentacle at the back of the platform, we just have classes that have immunity, such as Hunter Turtle or Mage Ice Block or Paladin Bubble. They just solo soak that tentacle whilst using that immunity. If you don't have any of these immunities for whatever reason, you'll just need to assign as many ranged players as possible to go to the back of the room and help soak that tentacle. Now that's all the abilities in phase one. They do come in quite frequently. However, they do not have that many bad overlap points. So you can pretty much deal with them in the same way throughout the entire phase. Once you get Hoya to 65% health, she will transition into phase two. Just make sure you do not have any of the slime adds up when you transition. Even if that means that you need to slow down damage on Hoya at one point, just to make sure you get that clean transition, it's super worth it because if you have adds up, you'll likely fall behind right from the start of the next phase. Once you finally made that transition into phase two, Hellia will leave the encounter area and you'll no longer have to fight her directly. Instead, you'll have to be dealing with tons of different types of adds. As soon as she does leave, she will, however, send a wave across the entire room. This wave pushes players back and deals a very small amount of damage. However, each time she sends in waves, they will do slightly more damage. And towards the end of the encounter, they're going to hurt quite a lot. Now, on the first wave that she sends in, you'll have two adds that spawn, a Grime Lord and a Nightwatch Mariner. It is incredibly important that whenever a Mariner spawns in this encounter, you switch to it and kill it off as soon as you possibly can. Because if it's alive for more than 25 seconds, it will cast its Lantern of Darkness, which pretty much two shots your entire raid. So you need to kill it fast. The Mariner itself only has two other abilities. The most important that you need to know about is Give No Quarter. This will just spawn a white circle on the ground, which will then explode shortly afterwards. Make sure you move out of it. And the Mariner will also buff itself with attack speed. Kind of irrelevant, as the mob does no damage anyway. And as soon as the Mariner is dead, you need to swap to the Grime Lord. Now, the Grime Lord has a lot of AoE abilities, and as you can see, we don't tank him on top of the Mariner purely because of all of these abilities. He does a Sludge Nova, which deals a very large amount of damage to anyone within 15 yards of him. You've got to make sure that you're never inside it. But he also does Anchor Slam. This deals a massive burst of damage to the tank and anyone around the tank. And on top of that, it'll also knock them into the air and give them a debuff that increases the damage they take by 400% for 6 seconds. It's vital that melee aren't near the tanks when this ability goes off because it will one-shot you. In tanks, you want to use a cooldown. The other ability that Grime Lord has is Fetid Rot. This is a debuff that is placed on a few of your Ray members that deals ticking damage and also reduces the healing that you take. Once this debuff times out, you'll deal a burst of damage to anyone within 5 yards of you, but you'll also spread a brand new debuff on top of them. So it's vital that as soon as this debuff is about to run out, that you're near no other player. And this is the most important thing in phase two, because if it does jump to people and it starts covering your entire raid, you can wipe very, very quickly. Also throughout this phase, decaying minions will spawn. They'll fixate on a random player and melee hit them. These melee hits don't do that much. However, they gain a stacking damage buff while they're alive. So the melee attacks are going to start hurting more and more. Now, when these adds die, they will leave a big pool of goo on the floor. However, the goo is washed away from the waves that come from Hellia. We recommend that you completely ignore the adds while you're downstairs when you're fighting the Grime Lord and the Mariner. And this is because at certain points in the encounter, you are forced to retreat to one of the elevated platforms on the side of the room to avoid a massive bombardment of waves. And while you're running towards that platform, the decaying minions sort of funnel and they'll try and follow you up. It's the perfect time for you just to CC them and just AOE them down. Now, you may notice that there are also a load of tentacles around the room. There's nine in total. There's three at the back and there's three around each elevated platform. These tentacles don't do anything at all. However, you must kill all nine of them to transition into the last phase. Now, if you have your raid team just spread out random and you're killing random tentacles, it's very likely that you're gonna be in this phase for a long time, and you can't be in this phase for a long time. Not only are the waves doing more damage, but Hellia is also casting Torrent, which deals damage to random players, but the damage is amplified over time. So if you're in here for too long, you're also gonna to take too much damage for Torrent. So it is instead important that you organize your movement and get through this phase as cleanly and as quickly as you possibly can. So we're going to give you guys a quick rundown on how to get through this phase step by step, just so you know what to do at what point. So as soon as hell your transitions, you want some range DPS to move over to the right side of the room and just chunk some damage to the tentacles that are up on the raised platform. The Mariner and the Grime Lord should be picked up and brought to the three tentacles at the back of the room. As soon as this has happened, all DPS should swap to those big adds and kill them off as soon as possible, whilst cleaving as much as possible to the three tentacles at the back. Once the two adds are dead and all the minions have spawned, you want to retreat to the platform on the left-hand side of the room. But before running up, make sure that any players that have Fetid Rot drop their debuff away from the raid. Waves potentially could be coming in at this point. Still, you need to make sure you stay out and instead spot heal those targets. As the adds start funneling while they're going up the stairs, you want to send your strongest AoE DPS to kill them down. 
and you just want to crowd control them on the spot. The idea is, is that all the ads die downstairs, the waves clear out all the shit that's on the ground, while you have the rest of your DPS upstairs, killing the two tentacles, and cleaving onto the one that's downstairs. Range DPS should be focusing mainly on the one that's downstairs, as the melee obviously can't reach it. Also, healers, you have virtually nothing to do. You should be damaging the tentacles as well. And really, you should look at having all three tentacles dead by the time the waves have subsided. As soon as this bombardment of waves has stopped, you'll then get another Mariner and a Grime Lord. Again, blow up the Mariner like you did first time round, but tank it right next to the tentacle that's on the floor next to the right elevated platform. As soon as the Mariner's dead, take the Grime Lord there instead. During this time though, you will have minions spawn. You want to ignore them as much as you possibly can and get ready to retreat to the rightmost platform where you can then just repeat what you did on the left. Funnel them, CC them and get your AoE DPS to blow them up as soon as possible. You then want to kill the two remaining tentacles on the elevated platform before the next set of adds come in. Otherwise they will follow you into the next phase which is a complete disaster. So make sure you kill those two remaining tentacles as soon as you possibly can and then you'll cleanly transition into phase 3. Now phase 3 has a mixture of mechanics from phase 1 and phase 2, however all of these abilities have slight changes to them and have to be dealt with in a slightly different way. Now the entire phase is just about optimizing the amount of space you have as quite a few abilities coat the room in green goo, you just want to keep it as clean as possible before a wave comes across and clears it for you and then the fight kind of repeats from there. Now most of the goo will be coming from orbs of corrosion. These orbs work the same way as the orbs in phase 1, however it will now leave green patches on the ground as it chases the fixated player. Because of this you want to have the raid hugging the sides of the room so that when the orbs spawn they can just be kited along those walls. As a fixated player, if you need to run through some previous green patches just so you can kite the orb in a clean way, then feel free to do that. The patches don't do a lot of damage, as long as you don't stand in them for a long period of time and that healer spot heal you, you should be pretty safe. Now tanks or melee players, if you are fixated by an orb, you can just do a loop by running up the elevated platform that's near you and then just jumping down. This makes it so that most of the green goo that spawns, it will be on the wall rather than on the floor, which helps optimize space and it also allows you to get back to the boss within a short period of time. The main thing you need to take away from this is that you need to keep the middle of the room clear for the incoming breaths. This breath works very similarly to phase 1, it will deal damage to the tank and pretty much one shot anyone else. However, instead of leaving an armor reducing debuff, it will now instead leave a debuff that reduces all the healing that you take by a large amount. Because of this, it is super important that the tank is topped up before the breath comes in and that they use large damage reduction cooldowns, including the external cooldowns from your healers, just so that they have a large amount of health after the breath goes off. You also want your tanks to taunt on the breath just because of this debuff in the exact same way as phase 1, just taunt after each breath. Now this breath can be faced pretty much anywhere on normal mode as long as nobody else is really hit by it, however on heroic it will send out several bolts. Once these bolts hit the ground they'll do a large amount of damage to the raid and apply a raid wide healing absorption shield on everyone. But if a player stands within the purple marker and soaks the bolt as it lands, they'll take the damage and the healing absorption shield instead. You need to have all of these bolts soaked by players. If more than one of them goes off, it can very easily lead to a wipe. You don't need to have more than one player in per bolt. One will be fine per purple marker. However, if you want to be more safe than sorry, then just lob a couple players in each. It doesn't particularly matter. We recommend that you face the breath down the middle of the room to make it so that players can easily get to the bolts at any point. It is so important that no goo is in the middle of the room just for this reason, as you don't want to be taking the ticking damage from it as you're soaking one of the bolts. If you know that a wave will come across the room before the next breath comes in, then feel free to start cutting any orbs into that free space just to reduce the damage that you take. These waves, although they are a blessing because they do clear up space, they can come in at quite annoying times, so just after breaths or just after you've been taking damage from orbs, they can be a bit of a pain. So if you are low when this wave is about to come in, it's really important that you keep yourself up by using some sort of personal cooldown. These waves don't come in that often, so you could technically assign healing cooldowns for it. There isn't really another point to use them, so try it if you're struggling. Now each time you do get a wave, you'll also get a Nightwatch Mariner. The Mariner has the exact same abilities as Phase 2, however he now has 100% more health. All DPS need to swap to him immediately, because again, you need to kill him within 25 seconds, otherwise the Lantern of Darkness is going to one-shot you. Now when the Mariner spawns, it's vital that your off-tank doesn't pick him up. The off-tank is going to have the breath debuff, so there's no clean way of healing him up, and also he's probably going to be kiting an orb. Make sure you use MD and tricks to try and get the Mariner to the main tank, so the raid can deal damage to him, as well as cleaving onto Hellier at the exact same time. On top of that guy, you'll still have the Taint of the Sea debuffs. Deal with them in the exact same way that you dealt with them in Phase 1, just instantly dispel them. 
Tanks make sure that you're not dispelled on top of the breath position. You'll also have a few decaying minions spawn. It's really important that these guys in the last phase do die really quick. You simply cannot ignore their stacking damage buff. And when they are about to die, it's really important that you kite them into locations of the room where they're not going to be an issue, where they do leave their goo. If you want to be clever, you can actually move into a goo patch, stun the mob, and then move out. That way the goo's just stacking on top of old goo. That's a really clean way of doing it. But keep in mind that if you are going to use that strategy, you don't do it at the exact same time that something else is going on, such as orbs or a breath or, you know, anything that could make it messy. However, if the ads do just so happen to die, like, right underneath your feet in a clean area, it's not the end of the world, because a wave, of course, will eventually come along and clear it, but it does make things more difficult for everybody else. And that's everything that you need to know for this last phase, is simply how those abilities work. There's no special strategy, really. It's just try and put goo as far away from people as possible, put in a position where it's safe for other people so that you maximize the space that you have to avoid the other abilities, such as the taint of the CD buff, or making it so you actually have room for the breath to go down the middle and other players not get hit by it. It's just simple things like that, really. It's just maximizing the space and playing it safe. But to make this phase a little bit easier, make it a little bit quicker, using Lust isn't a bad idea here, using uh, Time Warp and Heroism and all that shit, using that in this particular phase once your cooldowns are up is probably the best thing to do because you don't really need Bloodlust in phase one or two, so you might as well use it here instead. So thank you very much for watching, guys. If this guide helps you out at all, then please do drop us down a like. And if you'd like to know more about this encounter or you'd like to see a phase-by-phase -phase breakdown or you've forgotten anything, then go check out our written guide out over on Wowhead. But before we do go, I'd like to credit all of our supporters over on Patreon. Thank you very much for the support over the past few months. And we shall see you all next week for the Mythic Guides. Yes, very exciting. Thanks yeah. for watching, guys. See you next time. Thanks for watching.